Uh, good evening to all. Welcome to this uh, Thursday's presentation entitled uh, Pre-Trend Generative Transformer and the Future of Radiology. My name is David and I'm the founder of uh, Radiology Without Borders. As we begin uh, tonight's talk, I would like us to reflect on uh, a little bit of something that happened in history. We have to take cognizance that history plays a pivotal role in many of the things that we do in our lives. And that we can never forget what happened yesterday because what will happen tomorrow is predominantly controlled by what, by what happened the previous day. In 1996, uh, Gary Kasparov played uh, a game of chess with Deep Blue. Man being Gary Kasparov and the machine being Deep Blue. The gentleman that you're seeing in a dark suit here uh, works for IBM. He was moving the chess pieces on behalf of this computer, which is Deep Blue. So for every move that uh, Gary Kasparov made, this man made it on this keyboard, then the computer would play, then this man would move the chess pieces on the board. This game ended with uh, uh, five games won being won by Kasparov and six games. Actually, Deep Blue won only one game and Gary Kasparov won five. After a year, IBM decided to upgrade the um, the hardware and the software. And in this particular instance, Kasparov, who had won five the previous year, managed only to win one. Deep Blue won two and three were ties. So what does this tell us? It's telling us that in terms of the computing power, there was an increase. And we're talking about 1997. But if you can fast forward to 2023 in terms of the advances, in terms of the hardware and software, it has grown in leaps and bounds. And this is why we see that machines are getting smarter and smarter. But let's try and drive the point home with the next slide. I entitled this slide as in the writing on the wall in which we see uh, the coyote there over the cliff. So Prof. Geoffrey Hinton, who is actually a net neural networks expert and he's a, a leader in that area, he gave a statement during a talk in 2016. But there are three profound points that you have to get from this uh, his talk. And that is one, he said that we need to stop training radiologists. I think Essentially, this is not necessarily directed to radiologists, but it says, let us stop training people that are involved in film reporting. Because we know nowadays there are quite a number of people that are doing film reporting and not necessarily radiologists. Radiographers are also reporting and they are called consultant uh, radiographers who do film reporting. So we are aware that there is that aspect. So in short, he was saying, let's stop training people that do film reporting in radiology. Number two, he said that in the next five to 10 years, algorithms would be better than people in assessing medical images. Then three, he likened a radiologist, and I think let us replace this, that he likened experts in film reporting to a coyote that is already over the edge of the cliff that hasn't just looked down and yet it's evident that the ground awaits. So why are we saying all these things? We are saying all this because in the recent past, after a very long winter in AI, suddenly there is quite a lot that is happening on the AI space. 
So we cannot ignore the impact of what is happening on the AI space because according to the history, whatever has happened in radiology, the things that would happen in other areas such as computing engineering would affect what happens in radiology because we are great consumers of technology. So I cannot go about to talk about what GPT is without addressing the aspect of what artificial intelligence is. A very simple definition of what artificial intelligence means is just the, the ability of machines to simulate human intelligence and the process is achieved through programming so that the machine can act or can think and learn like humans. So artificial intelligence is used to create intelligent machines that should be able to perform certain tasks. In the industries, we see robots that will be able to assemble cars. That is all part of uh, artificial intelligence. We see applications that are used for speech recognition. That is part of artificial intelligence. So this, everything else helps us in terms of making decisions or problem solving. So if we look at deep, a, deep learning AI and we focus on uh, um, language processing, we realized that in 2011, we had the advent of C when we bought our iPhones then. So Siri was integrated in as a virtual assistant. IBM brought in Watson in 2011. Uh, then we had Eugene in 2014. The same year we had Alexa um, that was able to complete shopping tasks. By 2017, we see AlphaGo. And by November of 2022, we had ChatGPT hitting the market. So let's have a quick look at what artificial intelligence is. We have a number of uh, types of uh, intelligence, reactive machines, limited memory theory of the mind and the like. So if I pick, for example, a, a reactive machine, this basically will be an AI system that would only react to the present. And the system does not have the ability to use the past experience, which means that it is only able to respond based on the current. Whilst a system such as limited memory, this one, it can also learn from the past and be able to make the, an informed decision on the current state, but basing it on what happened previously. Now, our focus has to be on two aspects now, predominantly, general artificial intelligence and narrow artificial intelligence. So when we speak of general artificial intelligence, we are looking at a type of AI that can perform any intellectual task that a human can. This is still in research phase, but looking at the, the progresses made in the recent past, we see that we are now approximating the artificial general intelligence. But predominantly now, when we see what is on the market, we see that we are predominantly using a narrow artificial intelligence in which we have systems that perform a specific task. We'll get back to this as we um, advance. So let us introduce uh, the topic of GPT. When we say GPT, what are we talking about? GPT simply stands for a generative pre-trained transformer. And this is just a machine learning model that is based on a transformer architecture. So what is a transformer architecture? The transformer architecture is a neural network that is suited for tasks that involve sequential data. So that is very important, sequential data. And what are we talking about? It's sequential data, which is arising from a natural language processing and speech recognition. So the system is designed that you, the input can be a variable length, it can be long. And the output sequences that it, you, it is based on self-attention mechanisms that will weigh the importance of the different parts of that input sequencing. So in a paper uh, published in 
Bentin by Vaswani and others. He is the one that introduced um, the aspect of the transformer architecture. And in the paper was entitled, In Attention is All You Need. So this was based on self-attention mechanisms, which would allow a model to weigh the importance of different parts of the input as Elia alluded to. So this model focuses on the most relevant parts of the input and will make prediction based on a global understanding as opposed to the narrow approach that we talked about in narrow uh, AI. So if we focus now to in 2022 November, we have GPT-3 and the rise of what we call chat GPT. So this uh, language model, what did it take? So it took 8 million web, web pages, 165 billion parameters, 570 gigabytes of text data. So this is the information that is being used to train it in terms of the pre-trained words, and then later fine tuning it so that it is able to perform specific tasks such as language translation. So we look at the, the base is quite broad. The fine tuning now has to suit a specific uh, instruction that we want this system to be able to do, which may include text summarization, for example, or it, we may use it to, um, to do maybe synthesis in terms of voice recognition and the like. So the fine tuning process is very important because this is what allows the model to take advantage of the general features learned during the pre-training and then adapt them to specific tasks. So GP2 was actually a version that did generate amazing human-like text and was able to complete different tasks with high accuracy. So this is what now made a lot of people to gain interest in it, as well as us in the health field. So we are looking at GPT-1, then GPT-2 to GPT-3. So various applications that were generated that base their concept or their API is that of the GPT. So these would include frequently asked questions for patients, a lawyer board, answering systems. So all of them would give an, a, a, a human computer kind of interaction in which if I needed help, for example, I had an operation, uh, maybe uh, I had open reduction with internal fixation. Now the, the wound is taking some time to heal. I would engage this bot to ask, oh, I had surgery done on my uh, forearm. I had an open fracture of the radius and that or if done. So the machine would then engage me as if there was a person on the other side that guide me. Okay, if there's swelling, the home remedy may be a cold compression. If there are signs of infection you're having, maybe spiking temperature, you may consult your GP and then be given antibiotics. And so that it, it acts now as... Um, a point of contact without the actual human being available for that particular aspect. So like I earlier indicated, these are models that are trained on massive amount of data, but this is data that has to become, that has to come from repositories such as the, the common crow, which we will talk about as we go further in terms of our talk. So we cannot talk about GPD without talking about natural language processing. What is natural language processing, you may ask? So this is a subfield of artificial intelligence that deals with the interaction between computers and human language. It encompasses a wide um, range of techniques from processing, analyzing, and generating human language data, such as text or speech. In our day-to-day -day life, we have been exposed to things uh, such as uh, uh, dragon that may be used for uh, dictation of uh, reports. In our daily life, we use Siri, we use Alexa, we use Google Assistant. You want to watch um, your movie on uh, maybe say Netflix, or you're looking for a certain video on YouTube, you simply press that little button with uh, the three dots, and then you speak through the mic. It then from your accent, it's able to pick what you're trying to say, then it pops on the screen. If it is the correct one, yes, you go ahead and then say, search for that, then it gives you the result. So all these are 
things that are coming from natural language uh, processing. So what are the techniques that are used in nat natural language processing? So you can have what is called uh, part of uh, speech tagging. So in, within your speech, the software will be able, or the program will be able to identify parts of the speech, such as nouns, uh, verbs, and adjectives. So then there's also something that is called named entity recognition, which we may be quite familiar with, or we may have even seen in movies. Um, the military, the state intelligence would use uh, tools such as named entity recognition. And I think some years back when uh, uh, former President Barack Obama was uh, in power and they were trying to you know, target uh, certain um, um, uh, people that were on their wanted list so words like terrorists, words like uh, Osama bin Laden, these were named entity recognition in which the state securities and other international uh, security wings would use their systems in which they would be able to pick up if a certain person spoke in a certain way in terms of the intonation and names and what, then they would look at that and then be able to say, this voice that we've picked up, it's coming from which area? No, it's probably coming from geographical location in uh, Pakistan, X, X, Y, Z. So that is just to illustrate the point in terms of name entity recognition. But there's also sentiment analysis. In sentiment analysis, basically, we are trying to see the emotional tone from a piece of text, whether it is negative, positive, or neutral. And the same may be said in terms of the voice. If someone calls 911 and is in distress, from the voice, we could tell that this person actually they code, but we are able to sense this or uh, that. So that's about some of the techniques that are used in NLP. So if we look at GPT and NLP, we realize that GPT has a vast vocabulary. That if we now it's uh, incorporated with as part of the natural language processing, the system that we are able to generate now can give us human-like translations. And when you look at the rise now of GPT-3, we are able to use this system to be able to obtain state-of-art results in terms of text generation. That would include like essay writing in which you would ask a system to be able to write a book for you to say, no, can you give me um, a, a book, um, a storybook for kids on dogs or sheep and the like. And then you could uh, also make it to write a movie script for you. By the same token, we see other models that are able to convert speech into maybe images, systems uh, such as um, Mid Journey, systems such as Synthesia.io. So all these are actually artificial uh, intelligence uh, systems. So here I'm showing you a non-contrasted um, uh, image of a CT brain, which is an Axios, Axios scan, and this is a patient coming in through ER. So we should be asking, how can we incorporate these technologies? These technologies are being incorporated in which a system such as this one, which it comes from BrainWorks, it would look at this image, which to someone, it may look like there is nothing abnormal on it, like it looks very, like maybe quite subtle, there's nothing obvious, we are not, uh, maybe we are not seeing a mass, there's no obvious mass effect, but with trained systems, you are able to see that there are actually subtle changes that you can see in this air and this air, which you would not, but this identification has been detected using an AI to by Brainworks. Let's proceed. So if we look at uh, GPT in the medical field, this would rely predominantly on the, its understanding and generation of natural language text, which makes it suitable for various medical tasks. And what are we talking about? We are talking about decision support systems clinical decision support system. So this can assist the radiographers, radiology, sonographers, such in areas such as image captioning, image report generation, image retrieval. So this would then save us 
a lot of time and improve in terms of the quality of the work. So the reports that we'll be able to obtain, there would be consistent and accurate medical reports, thus improving the communication between healthcare providers. So in terms of radiology now, uh, GPT or the generative pre-transformers can now be incorporated because our field has a lot of language understanding. So the GPT now would be able to perform certain radiology tasks. Like I say, this would be involved um, training a GPT in terms of the radiology data set to generate captions for the X-ray images, which would then improve the searchability and interpretability of those images. So these would be X-ray images. There may be um, MRI images where you train the machine to say, no, look, what you are looking at is the cingulate uh, gyrus. What you are looking at is the central sulcus. This is the prefrontal lobe. This is the occipital lobe. So once you train it, the system now then learns, but this has to be learning over a large data pool set in which now based on the learning, it's able to predict the next, as we said earlier on that, this is based on the attention method system. So additionally, GPT can be used to retrieve similar images from a cardiology data, a radiology database. Say for example, if we define the parameters of what a subarachnoid hemorrhage looks like, because of that learning and the power of GPT, it would then be able to predict which other images on the database at a given time, if in case you are doing uh, research, which ones uh, look similar to that and show subarachnoid hemorrhage, which would then be used maybe say, for example, in an education setup, but we'll get back to that as well. So on this uh, image, I'm trying to show you what, where we, things were in terms of the, the current narrow AI. Here we are looking at mammography computer aided design in which we are seeing a lesion. So the systems that were used, um, or that may still be in use, they use methods such as the highlight features in terms of edge detection to see whether in that lesion that we are seeing where there's an asteroid, is there, are there speculations around the lesion? You can also use the methods such as the fuzzy logic method, the random forest classifiers. In ultrasound, for example, we have uh, automated, fully automated and semi-automated fetal biometry. I've been exposed to semi-automated fetal biometry. So basically what this entails is that when you are trying to um, do your fetal biometry in terms of uh, arriving at an estimated uh, gestation age as well as uh, the fetal weight and you're using maybe formulas such as the Hadlock formula, or I'm not really sure whether um, the method that was uh, proposed by Nze and uh, others has been implemented because there was an attempt in Nigeria by one gentleman trying to come up with an alternative to formulas such as the Hadlock and Chetney. But if you use, say, for example, hard look, you'll be measuring your bipyretal diameter, your abdominal circumference, and you have to move around your calipers trying to measure, you know, a outer to inner. But with semi-automated fetal biometry and using um, edge uh, detection methods, such as the, the hard like features, the machine would quickly drop the, par the, clipper, the calipers on its own. It would place it on the outer table of the cranium to the inner table and then measure. So that would take away your role as a practitioner to be able to placing those calipers. And in fully automated, that measurement would be fully automated. But let us be mindful that one size does not fit all because the algorithm that is used for the CT head is not going to be the same as chest. We cannot use the semi-automated fetal biometry in ultrasound to be able to measure, for example, bladder volume because we also have the smart bladder in which the software would quickly detect the bladder boundary and then calculate the volume for us when we are doing urology examinations. So if we focus on image um, captioning in radiology, so basically when we say what image caption, what are we talking about? We are talking about a process of generating natural language descriptions of radiology images, which may be X-rays, MRI, or CT. 
So the GPT in this case is trained on a radiology data set to generate captions for these images, which it would improve, like Elia said, searchability and interpretability of the images. So the data set, um, uh, the GPT will be trained on this data set and their corresponding captions, then fine tune it to a specific task. But it is really important that if you are going to do all this, it is done um, on images that follow a specific protocol. Is it coming from the IUM? Is it coming from the International Society of um, Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology? So these have to be standard images. Um, we cannot afford, I'm aware of quite a number of learning platforms, WhatsApp groups in which people would share images. So if these images that we do in our facilities, they do not conform to a specific standard, we cannot use them because as it we've always learned in uh, when we talk about machine learning, junk in, junk out. So you cannot use data that is not quality data. So the data integrity is quite a very important aspect when we are looking at aspects such as image caption. So the generated captions can help radiographers to quickly identify key images of key features of an image. So we may want to compare with the red dot system. You look at a fracture and then you put a red dot. How effective are those systems and how effective are these systems such as incorporation of GPT? So if we use artificial intelligence, it means that in terms of outcomes for our patients, we are going to have improved health outcomes. I did talk about search, uh, searchability. And of course, I gave an example of, say, a subarachnoid. Uh, hemorrhage. So in terms of uh, report generation, your machine can be able to identify, but is it able to generate? So with GPT, we are talking about being able to generate reports in which is the process of creating a written description of the findings. Um, a CT head or was performed from the cavern to the best. Um, there was no evidence of midline shift or midline structures appear intact. The pineal gland uh, is seen and appears normal. The calcifications in the choroid plexus, X, Y. So we have a report coming out of a system because of GPT coming out like that in which there is no human intervention. So this data set, like an alias, it has to be fine tuned to generate reports for specific areas. So the importance of this system is that the reports that are coming out have to be accurate and consistent. And there have been a number of uh, researches done even based on narrow AI in which we see that the narrow AI DEMS does a very amazing job in comparison to the human counterparts. So this means that we'll be able to avoid human errors that would arise as a consequence of either omission, incorrect diagnosis, and it can also act as a second read, ensuring the best for the patients. So in terms of the uh, uh, GPT and the radiology workflow, this can be done at a number of stages. This could be in terms of uh, doing the uh, image uh, acquisition. It may happen in, during the process of image interpretation or report generation. So this basically depends on how you want to implement it into your system. But at the end of the day, those people that are involved in terms of the work would be assisted greatly because it would provide relevant information at in a timely uh, fashion. So the work workload can reduce, it can save time and uh, cost as well. So let us look at, uh, I think this is quite profound and interesting. Like, let us look at what is the impact in terms of GPT and radiology. We can use this. Um, in 2016, I was um, in, in the Philippines, in Manila, there's a company called Life Track Systems in which they were already working with the developers on a system that is called the Decision Support System for radiology. So if you are reporting, for example, on... Um, brain CT, 
the system would open the actual image acquired from a patient on to your left and on your right, you'd have an annotated diagram or a captioned image of the CT brain that you are able now to use like, okay, what am I looking at? Which area is this? Or is this, this it then tells you, no, you are looking at the caudothalamic groove. Is there a bleed in that? So it would then enforce the learning. And then it can give you explanations and examples. Now with GPT, you can also be able to generate quizzes and simulations because remember, uh, just like in the aviation industry, if you're going to train as a pilot, you will be put in a simulator, flight simulator. So the actual whole experience will be like, it is an actual flight. So you do not really have to be on a plane flying it because these are very expensive things. You don't want to fly a plane. So if you use a simulation, it would actually sim give you quite um, an area of uh, sophisticated situations that you would not really encounter in real life. That would expand your horizon in terms of your knowledge and uh, skills. So sometimes we get complex um, cases, but these, if we are asked what are the complex cases that you've encountered, we are more likely just to, to regurgitate those that we've encountered. But using systems such as GPT, the system would be able to come up and um, propose other very complex cases that may arise. And this would then be able to teach us how we would approach certain cases uh, in future. The same we say that in terms of uh, standard reporting, we could use the system to show us uh, and aid us in terms of the standard uh, reporting. We could also use them to refine thoughts uh, uh, and also generate uh, ideas if we use systems such as chat GPT, copy.ai, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, like I mentioned uh, is that this can also come and as a way of personalized learning. COVID taught us one thing that now we can use technology. So it's no longer about click and motor. So now you'd be able to personalize a learning experience. So the programs would be tailored as per my rate of consumption of the knowledge that I'm being given. So if I'm a slow learner, the system would come out in such a way that it would be tailored by the system as I respond that no, I'm a slow learner, I need to learn different from someone that is a fast learner. But also um, GPT offers us a room for research in areas such as um, echocardiography. So there's an area which is quite emerging now. It's called image-based computational fluid dynamics or patient-specific CFD. We've heard of the PANDA. The PANDA is basically a predictive analytics via network distributed algorithm. So the, the algorithm is distributed on a network for multi-system disease. We know that there are rare diseases. So rare diseases are basically are diseases that would affect about um, less than 200,000 uh, people. So you, you find that the diseases that are rare are quite difficult to diagnose. And this is why in the US, you have uh, centers that are called the Undiagnosed Disease Network. So these are people that are using AI in terms of implementing them as part of the metrics in terms of um, uh, disease um, detection and diagnosis. Because I know for a fact I've been in situations where we have patients that are seen time and again, and a diagnosis is not even in sight. So uh, with uh, GPT, we are now closer to perfection in terms of being able to diagnose diseases. So just a little bit of um, um, a nugget or a, a little bit of maybe, what shall we call it? We shall call it a snack. So just a little bit to talk about uh, CFD. So basically when we talk about computational fluid dynamics, this is just a simulation of, of blood flow in the heart and uh, blood vessels and provides detailed information about the flow patterns, the velocities, because remember that when we're doing echo, we are looking at flow patterns, velocities are important, shear stresses are also important. So with this, with CFD, we are able to simulate the mechanical properties, which are quite important when we are looking at echo, which were things such as uh, wall thickness, stiffness, um, 
when we say that there is a, a abnormal wall motion, so we are able to get it from such simulations. Now, CFD can also be modeled to analyze electrical conductivity on the head. Now, all this valuable information that would get from CFD, we would then do what is called echo fusion. So one of the approaches is that you may obtain your echo data, your images, your parasthenol short axis, your parasthenol long axis, um, you measure your PISA and all that. But with that information, you then input in the CFD. Now, when you input in the CFD, it means that you are now creating that simulation tailored to that particular patient that you were doing. And then you this is now what you'd be getting as your image-based or your patient-specific CFD in which the images from your echo, um, you use them to segment the heart and the blood vessels. And then using this segmented approach, you can then create a three model of that heart, of the heart of the patient that you were scanning. So this would improve the accuracy of the reports that you would obtain. It's always important to consider issues of uh, data privacy and data privacy is a talk everywhere globally. And right now there's quite a number of issues that are coming up because of issues of breach of security. Uh, in the financial world, we've seen the rise of uh, cryptocurrencies which use blockchain technology in order to secure payments. So this system is not immune to that. There is still an issue of data privacy. So it, it's very important that when we're dealing with patient information, it is crucial that this information is protected from unauthorized access and breaches. We need to maintain patient privacy and this must be compliant with regulations. The data has to be encrypted. So this brings in aspects of things like uh, blockchain, smart contracts and the like. Then of course, there has to be a limitation as to who accesses the data. Regular monitoring and auditing of the system logs is quite important. Performing vulnerability checks is an assessment. Doing penetration tests to see it, which area is weaker that can lead into people entering the system and infiltrating it because these are systems that are always performing these tasks on the network, across networks, via the web and all that. And this is also brings us to us to the third, uh, the third web. So in terms of the uses of GPT, what can we say? We can use GPT uh, in automated image interpretation. So which means full automation to detection of the disease to providing the report, which is signed off by Dr. Chat GPT. We can also personalize the treatment planning and then we can optimize them as well. Like I said, concerning the issue of uh, patient specific uh, computational fluid dynamics. We can also use them as part of the predictive modeling and risk assessment. There was a recent paper that was published on Alzheimer's in 2022, I think, uh, yeah, sometime in 2022, looking at prediction models for Alzheimer's. So these are the things that we're talking about and that is based on GPT. So in terms of the quality control, this, the system would help us quite a lot in that area as well as uh, error detection. What are the benefits? We're looking at increased efficiency and productivity. We are looking at improved uh, accuracy and decision making. And we are also looking at enhanced patient care and reduced workload for radiologists, radiographers, and sonologists. Having said that, we need to look at the realities depending on which side of the globe we are. Some may run across the board, whether you're in the developed world or in the developing world, it may be the same. But in terms of the cost, the initial cost, they are always high. I mean, where are you going to get a 175 billion parameters, 8 million web pages? So these are systems that require a lot of money. But we are indeed, it's quite exciting because uh, systems such as Chat GPT, it's API, you can build on it. And the cost, cost for developers is not that much. Then there's 
depending on where you are, there may be limited access to data and expertise. There may also be lack of data in uh, data integrity. I know this one. I would speak for a fact that the challenges in in Africa is that even basic data is not captured. On an ultrasound machine, you may find quite a number of parameters, name of the patient, age, date of birth, height, the BP, and all that. People would do echocardiography without uh, connecting ACG, so the exams would not be ECG gated. Maybe even for the cardiac CT exams, they will not even be uh, um, ECG gated. So these are some of the examples in which we produce data that is not quality. So in terms of integrity, really, you cannot be, you cannot really use it. So these are some of the challenges when you look at implementation processes. It becomes quite a challenge. If you are going to train, for example, a system where you want to have a tailored algorithm for maybe automated fetal biometry, you're going to find that you're going to have a challenge in terms of data collection because, say, for example, the BPD would not be captured at the correct level uh, to measure the BPD, even the female and even the abdominal circumference. So if we have data that we've stored that is not is non-standardized, then there's a problem. Of course, the aspects of uh, cultural and language barriers, there are issues of regulatory framework ethical issues with the regulation, you find that in Africa, we have a challenge in terms of implementation. I'll take, for example, you know, like uh, Forex trading uh, or crypto trading. In most of the countries, they do not have pieces of legislation that govern these. And the only thing is that the governments, they simply make it illegal because there is no regulatory framework that can guide them. There are no pieces of legislation. Slater, there are no statutory instruments. So it becomes a challenge. So in Africa, we need to start from a perspective of addressing the regulatory framework by putting in place. And this is where now, as radiographers, as radiologists, as sonographers, we have to come to the table and begin to sit with our learned colleagues uh, in the legal framework to sit down and then give them ideas as to how these things can be um, uh, crafted. There's also an issue of um, job displacement, as earlier said by Professor Hinton, who said that we don't need to train radiologists. Probably we don't need to train radiographers that go into film reporting as part of uh, uh, raw new, I mean raw development or raw expansion. So these are the challenges that we are likely to encounter. Then there is lack of trained personnel and the absence of uh, standard operating procedures. So. If you do not have a domain expert, for example, a domain expert being a um, maybe a radiographer or radiologist that has done, you know, maybe computing has done, uh, ha is well informed in areas of neural networks, as well as radiology. If we do not have domain experts, that becomes a very difficult thing to implement in such an area. And I think these are things that the realities of Africa and other um, developing nations. So there are actually solutions to these challenges. And one of them is the collaboration between the industry, academia, and healthcare. And I would like to make you know, particular attention. When I was coming up with this presentation, and then I looked at the available literature, I'll tell you that it's quite disheartening because the bulk of works, research papers that are done in radiology, in radiography, in sonography, they are more uh, focused on, uh, I would say, mixed methods and that. There's, there's very little that is coming from the IT side. We have a lot of, uh, like our, our equipment, they are, they are based on computers. Now AI is coming into place. But there's very, very little papers that addresses, say, for example, like I never, I was looking for a paper to look at maybe a possible use of uh, quantum computing in terms of um, uh, tissue assessment, in terms of the heterogeneity of tissue. Because you realize that when you use your eyes to simply look at an image like we did with that CT brain, for you to see, to say, there is a subtle area that appears to be hypodense, and most likely there's a edema in that region. Your eye is only able to see up to a certain number of grayscale. You cannot see the entire 256 
uh, spectrum of grayscale. Gray so those are some of the areas in which we need to move into. We need to have more papers coming out of Africa so that when web crawlers, such as the common crawl, they collect data for their repository, it should be able to pick a study from Uganda that is looking at uh, implementation of uh, uh, GPT in film reporting, in patient scheduling, you know, just in a number of years, we need that. As we speak right now, most of the papers, like I said, that I will encounter, it will talk about um, maybe um, a assessment of um, people's um, or, the, or uh, adoption of maybe say transvaginal scan amongst, you know, uh, women of reproductive age, what are the challenges? But these, yes, they are important, but that which is overwhelming us now as a world is the impact of AI and we cannot run away from it. So I've already talked about the issues of domain experts and uh, the other area is investment in such things such as data infrastructure, and expertise. I talked about quantum computing. I came up with a very amazing concept uh, for PhD study, but the issue is where do I access the quantum computer? Because there is none. As far as I'm concerned, in Southern Africa, there, there is no quantum uh, computer. So we need to be able to explore those areas. Then we need to develop ethical and, re um, ethical and regulations that govern the use of AI and still it goes back to the domain experts. If we do not take time to learn computing and uh, incorporate that in our practice, we leave the room to the engineers, to the biomedical engineers, to software developers out there to be able to dictate to us what we need to do. So this means that we need to train and rescue radiologists, sonographers, and radiographers, because even in terms of the hardware, now you have uh, machines that can simply position themselves. A patient simply stands there, the x-ray is done by the machine. So we need reskilling and start to think of how we can be become multi-skilled to remain relevant, or else when 2026 20, hits, whilst others will be crying for losing their jobs to intelligent systems, we would have migrated to the next um, uh, location. So in summary, what are we saying? We are saying that AI is being used in a variety of applications in radiology, which includes image interpretation, analysis, treatment plan, and predictive modeling, as we saw from the paper that was done on Azamas, as we've seen in computational fluid dynamics, which is uh, patient specific. So AI has the ability to bring many benefits, including increased efficiency, improved accuracy, but we cannot run away from the challenges. So it means that our government, we need to be strong advocates wherever we may be so that there are funds that are directed to, towards uh, such projects. We need to address the regulatory issues as earlier alluded to. And we need to realize that for us to realize the full potential AI, we must foster collaboration between the industry, the academia, and the healthcare professional because the industries exist. We need to be able to engage people in, um, in Congo DRC where they are mining the piezoelectric. Let's look at, can we get piezoelectric materials that are coming out of Congo and look into them, whether they can give us faster transducers that can quickly uh, produce signal, pick it up, convert it into an electrical signal. Then we compound this with chat GPT or with GPT. Are these things possible? The answer is yes. So long term, we need to be looking at improving the healthcare systems in Africa. We have people that are disadvantaged by virtue of geographical locations. They may have only one radiologist in a country or one radiographer that is doing film reporting. We can expand this by implementing such systems because people cannot suffer because there is nobody that is able to perform that particular Task. So that is the road ahead, and these are the things that we need to be able to think about as the world evolves, because the world is evolving. And we also need to look at other areas that I may not have talked about, because this was not really centered on artificial intelligence, but we narrowed it to GPT. 
we could look at other models, things like I earlier said, mid journey, DAL E2 produced by OpenAI. We look at um, Synthesia.io. We should be looking at um, um, uh, all these other things that are on the market. How do we implement them in our day-to-day -day processes? I would like to thank you for paying attention and listening to this presentation. I do hope that this will ignite a fire in you to be able to look into this critically and explore the avenues on how we can take this to the next level. I thank you.